It's a good way to start the year, to press in and hear what God is saying to us, to set our direction, to really lift our sails and say, God, where are you moving and, and let me move with you? What, what are you saying and let me walk in step with you? And uh, that's something that, that the Lord is always faithful to direct me in. As I, as I turn the pages of a new year, I'm always looking for, um, for what are you saying, God? What do you, what do you have for me? Now, last year was a difficult and challenging year in many ways, but um, one, of the, one of the great things that uh, I've discovered is that in the midst of the challenges and difficulties, there's been tremendous ways that God has worked and God has blessed. And uh, one of the roles that I have right now is I'm involved with a lot of uh, missional works around, uh, around Asia and even beyond. And uh, I've, I've been meeting with different ones. In fact, yesterday I was with several pastors from Sri Lanka talking with them. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's really, really encouraging because despite the, the challenges, you can see that, that God has been faithful. God has met people. And there have been many, many areas where there has been growth. Uh, one of our churches in, in Sichuan in, in, in China... Uh, in October, they baptized 6,700 people. And, you know, you know, it's like, okay, these are challenging times, but, but God is rising up in his people. And he's giving uh, the first fruits of, a, of, an, of what I believe will be an end-time harvest. And uh, so uh, as the world is shaking, that means that those who aren't shaking, those who are standing on a rock, are, are going to become more and more attractive and noticed by those around who are, who are desperate. And so uh, I think in the midst of it all, it's been good. Personally, it's also had some, some pretty, I, I've had some pretty amazing times personally. Um, one of the things I did at the first week of the lockdown, the Lord told me to write a book. So I, I, wrote, I wrote a book, my, my story. Um, and I have some available, that, not enough probably, but uh, if, you, if you'd like a copy and you, um, and you put your name down there, they're $15 each, uh, you, and um, you, you put your name down there and I will, I will uh, make sure that I get them to you. I'll sign, I'll sign them and uh, make sure that I get them to you in the coming weeks. Because I have to do another printing. I've, I've uh, already run out of the, this printing, so... Um, but um, it's called A Mountain Man, and it's about, uh, I've actually been working in China for 36 years, so it, it's, uh, it's about many of my adventures, especially in my early days in the 80s and 90s when China was in the midst of tremendous upheaval and transformation. Um, so, but as I looked into this year, 2021, and at the end of last year, the Lord laid on my heart a particular person that... Uh, I believe that would be a model for me for the coming year, a, an example to me, a, a challenge to me, an inspiration to me. And I'd like to talk to you about this person today, and his name is Simeon. So if you would like to turn in your Bibles, uh, and I think we have the PowerPoint as well, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles um, to Luke chapter 2, and this of course comes from the, uh, the Christmas story. And, and in this, we have, um, I'm not sure, if I gonna, am I going to get uh, that screen as well? Broke down this morning. Okay, well, let me uh, open up my, uh, my, my this. So, in, in here, we have the, the story of when Jesus was, a, was just a baby. In fact, this story is, the, after Christmas, count 40 days, Okay is when this story happens. And it's about 40 days after Christmas right now. And that's a little bit coincidental. But uh, maybe that's the Lord as well. Because what happens in this story, the background of this story, is that Jesus is brought to the temple for the first time by his mother and father to be dedicated. And that happened at, at 40 days. When, a, when a, a Jewish girl gave her birth to her firstborn son, she would go to the temple at 40 days and she would offer a sacrifice. Now, if they were more 
prosperous, they would offer a, a lamb. But if they were poorer, they were allowed to offer two turtle doves. So I want you to picture, as I'm reading this, uh, this text, um, this young couple, a, a teenage girl carrying a baby, a young couple, maybe the husband's carrying a little, um, a little cage with a, a two turtle dove in it, and they're walking through a crowded temple, and suddenly this man, this old man, maybe a little bit hunched over, uh, probably a, a pretty long beard, comes walking up to them, and this is what happens. And behold, in verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which would be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So we have here a, a, a picture, a portrait of, of, a, of a young couple who are bringing their, their baby, their child, into the temple for the first time, and they're encountering this man by the name of Simeon. And this man has absolutely captivated me because I find him to be somebody who has such a quality about him. He's somebody that truly um, encountered God this day. And it's, it's the picture that we get is here's a man that lived for this moment. And that once this moment took place, he was ready to die. He was like, okay, uh, the word of the Lord that I have been brooding over, that I don't know how many years, right, that God had given him this promise and this word and that he had incubated it in his heart for all of this time, that he was going to see with his own eyes the Messiah, right? And, and so in this moment, he has this encounter with God and it becomes the most important thing that has ever happened to him in his life. And it's, it's almost as though he stayed alive long enough just, just for this moment. And every day when he woke up, he, said, he probably said, God, is this the day? Is this the day? And then when he woke up on this day, God said, this is it. <laughs> You're going to see it. And so he went into the temple with the, with the mind that I'm going to see the salvation that God has prepared for Israel. And not only for Israel, but for all of mankind. And so this is the, the picture that we have of this man, a man that I'm saying that is a man of the Spirit. Now, I, I'm, I'm not using the term saying he's filled with the Spirit just because I want us to have a fresh way of looking at this. Sometimes we think, well, I'm filled with the Spirit. I can speak in tums, tongues. But I want us to think of it in terms of not just being somebody who, who has received the baptism of the Spirit or the gift of the Spirit, but but somebody who truly is of the Spirit, somebody who is, is like Simeon, that he, he, in, he is able to discern and determine what God is saying and when he's saying it and walk in that um, awareness and walk in that revelation. Because in that time of the first, we can go to the next slide, by the way. In that, in that season when Simeon had this encounter with, with with, with Jesus, with the baby, right, is a time when um, there was talk about the Messiah. I mean, there were extraordinary things that were happening in Israel at that moment. Not to mention the fact that, that in those years preceding the coming of Jesus, there were whole sects and groups of people that, that were talking 
and, and, and studying the scriptures because they believed that finally the fulfillment of the sending of the Messiah was coming, was upon them. There was even uh, groups of people that, that would go to the mountains and spend, spend their, their, entire, their entire life basically living as, as, and waiting for the revelation of the, uh, of the, of the Messiah. And in, in, in this situation, of course, people were studying and researching, and, 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 and their idea of what the Messiah was going to be was, was completely different from who he, he ended up being, right? And it's only by the Spirit of the Lord that you're able to discern these things. It's not by what's happening in the atmosphere, not, not by all the extraordinary events that are happening, right? You had the, even, even around that time, you had the, the, the revelation of, of, to John the Baptist's parents, right? To Zechariah and to, and to Elizabeth. And, and, and the, the, all the extraordinary things that happened around the birth of, of, uh, of John the Baptist. The Bible says that in the whole mountain areas around Judea, these things were being talked about. Right? And then you have the birth of Jesus that's just taken place. And, and, and you have these, these magi and you have these extraordinary events that are taking place. And of course you have the, the, the revelation to the shepherds. Angels in the sky and, and, and people are being given dreams. Right, There's so many dreams that are taking place. It's like this is a moment in history where people's expectation and anticipation is really, 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 really high. God could do something any moment, right? And in that anticipation, I find it extraordinary that it was one old guy that seemed to know what God was doing, right? I mean, why, why is it that this wasn't being revealed? Why isn't it that the, the, the Pharisees and all of these that had dedicated themselves to it were missing it? And this man was able to capture what God was doing and what he was saying. I find that extraordinary. I find that challenging. In my own nation, in America, in the last few months, I have, I, I've been, I, I mean, the, the things that have been happening are, have been unexplainable in so many ways. They've been horrendous and terrible in so many ways. But the thing that grieves me the most is not who got elected and who didn't get elected. Did I want Trump to win? I wanted Trump to win because he brought things to our, our country that, um, that maybe it's hard for many people to understand. But for me personally, I like the idea that we don't have over 100,000 people coming across our borders, our southern borders, and somebody actually stood up and said, there's something wrong about this, and stopped the flow of illegal people coming into our country who brought drugs, who were trafficking people. There are certain things that, that he did um, that were good. He, he, he stood up against abortion. And as Christians, we feel pretty passionate about that in our country. And, and so somebody actually stood up for the unborn and was a voice for the unborn. And one of the first things that, that the new president did was he, he wiped that away. He, he, he made it possible to have abortion all the way through all nine months of your pregnancy. And, and with, a, with a swipe of his pen, he, he began to fund abortion overseas from our money. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's not, there's some things that we just get pretty passionate about when you think about it. But what I, what I also saw in the midst of that was I saw a, a whole church that was caught up in something. And, and in the midst of all of that, there was, there was confusion. And I'm thinking to myself, as, I, as I'm reading about the story of Simeon, I don't want to just move because other people are moving. I don't want to just follow the crowds and, and, and what are they saying about the Messiah and what is he doing? In the, I want to be in a place where, though nobody else understands the Spirit is speaking to me, and I know what God is saying, and when He's saying it, and where He's moving, and how He's moving. Now, obviously, I don't, I don't mean to say that I want to be alone in that. What I'm saying is that I don't want to be affected by the atmosphere, by, by the things that are happening around me. I want to be in such a place by, in the Spirit that I'm able to discern what God is saying, when He's saying it, and to walk with Him and be aware of of where he's moving. Because, beloved, if, 
Rock of Ages, if our people here at Rock of Ages, if you know and discern what God is saying, when he's saying it, when he's doing it, when the waters stir, you will be there. Okay? And others will miss, but... And we, of course, want as many people as possible to be in the flow of what God is saying and when he's saying it, but God is about to move in the earth. And I don't know about you, but my cry this year is, I want to be like Simeon. I want to know when, where, and I want to be there. Hallelujah. And so this is what stirs me about this man. Now, who was Simeon, right? That's an important question. Well, the Bible says that he was a man who, well, we can look at some of his characteristics, right? First of all, we know that he was an old man, right? How old was he? I don't know. At least 70 probably, maybe 80 years old, right? Uh, I mean, the guy is, is on his last leg. And um, I just want to stop and just say something for a moment about people who are old. Sometimes... When, when people get older, younger people forget that they're actually some of the greatest treasures that we have in, in the world and in our lives. And, um, I mean, my spiritual father is 85 years old, and like Caleb, he's still going for mountains. You know, he's not giving up. I just got a text from him this morning, you know, giving me a word from the Lord, okay? So it's like it, it, there's something that is extremely beneficial about being, about being old. And uh, I don't consider myself old. Uh, I have six grandchildren. I still don't consider myself old. You, you know what the definition of, of old is? Somebody who's 15 years older than you. But there's something about people who are, who are older. They, you know, they, they carry a wisdom. They carry an experience in life, right? But... You know, something else that's precious about being older is that you have more time on your hands. And if the body of Christ can acknowledge and can recognize and can activate the gifts of God that are in the older people, hallelujah, sometimes when everybody else is busy doing what they're doing, you have a Simeon who knows what God is saying because he spends time. He takes, he takes those precious days and hours and, and moments that he has as a, as a retired person who's, who's not consumed with all kinds of other things, and he focuses on the Lord. And in this story, of course, following, we have another woman who's, whose name is Anna. And Anna is 84 years old, and she was married for a little while, and then she had been a widow, and she spent the time devoted in the temple, praying and seeking the Lord and fasting, right? Right? And she was there too. The only two people that, that seemed to be aware of what God was saying when he was saying it were people that were, were ancient. As I was sitting here, I was thinking about one of my precious heroes or heroines from, from my years in China. And she's a woman by the name of Mabel. And the first time I met Mabel was in 1985. And by my by best estimates, okay, Mabel was probably 75 years old when I met her. And I met her in the strangest of circumstances because I just brought a team of people with many, many, I think we had 17 bags of Bibles that we'd brought all the way to Beijing from, from Hong Kong. And we had no idea what we were going to do with them. And we'd just gotten off the train, and we'd walked to a, an apartment, and we'd set our bags down. Um, uh, and uh, we were sitting there, and we weren't there for 10 minutes, and there was a knock on the door, and we honestly thought we had been followed by the police. And so we quickly brought all of our bags and everything. We put them into, a, like, a, a closet or behind things, and, and then we answered the door. And when we answered the door, there were these two old ladies who walked through the door. One was quite chubby, and the other one was thin as a rail. And they came in, and the little one, the skinnier one, I remembered so clearly, she looked up at me like this, and she said in English, she says, do you have any Bibles? Now, beloved, the Holy Spirit had spoken 
to Sister Mabel and said, Bibles are there. Go now. Like Simeon, right? I mean, she heard what God was saying. She followed the Spirit's voice. She walked to an apartment and knocked on the door, and there was the opening for her to get Bibles to deliver and distribute to people who were crying out to God in prayer for the Word of God. Can anyone say amen? I learned that she had graduated, the two of them, Esther and Mabel, had graduated from the Beijing Medical University in 1932. They'd become Christians at that time, and they'd stayed friends and stayed close all of these years. They had been persecuted. They had been tortured. They, so many things had happened to them through the years. You know, in, in 1949, she, she was trying to get out to Tibet to preach the gospel to the Tibetans, and she was arrested right at the border when the communists took over. And, uh, and so she never made it to Tibet. She was held in prison for a short time, and then she had to return back to Beijing. And lo and behold, she was 82 years old before she finally made it to Tibet. She went with a friend of mine, and they took a, a, uh, a bus from Qinghai, all over the highest roads on the, mount, on the, on the world, okay? The, the, they pass through the highest passes that you can go on a, on a road in, in the world. And while she was up there, she completely lost consciousness for three hours. <laughs> she Basically, she died while she was up there. And her, uh, my friend who was with her prayed for her. And by the time they came down the mountain into Lhasa, she all of a sudden <laughs> woke up again. And, uh, and she went right to business preaching the gospel to the Tibetans. There's something valuable about people who have time and who dedicate that time to seek the face of God. The other thing that we know about, about Simeon is he was a common man. He, isn't, he doesn't have any title. He doesn't have any pedigree. Uh, he, he wasn't a part of the sect of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or this one or that one. You know, by all appearances, it looks like he was just an ordinary guy, and yet God chose to speak to an ordinary guy. I, I hope that that is good for a lot of people that are here, okay? Because immediately the devil... What he does is he, he, he wants you to fit yourself into a disqualifying category, right? Well, that was for him. That was good. But that's not me because I'm like this. And, and the devil does that all the time, right? Because he wants you to disqualify yourself when God doesn't disqualify you. Because the reality of it is, is that Simeon was just like you. He was an ordinary person. Nothing special. Didn't have any, like, we don't know anything about his background. He doesn't have any title. He's just like an old guy, and yet God spoke to him. And God used him in a mighty way. We're talking about him 2,000 years later. How many times do you suppose Simeon's testimony has been talked about in the history of the church, right? In how many different languages? This guy is an inspiration. Hallelujah. The Lord used him. And, and, you know, I think sometimes we get this idea that God only uses or only, only works with certain special people. But in this whole season of the, of the birth of Jesus, you have times when he speaks to the shepherds. These are the common people, the people who are poor and they don't have any experience. And, you know, they even work the night shift, right? I mean, the, 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 these, were, these were not people who were like the, the high-ranking people in society. And yet, it's not like he, God only speaks to those type of people, too, because we find him, you know, showing up in, in, in a foreign country and speaking to people who are like these magi, these, these prophets, these people who are brilliant, you know, who, who are astrologers and who have studied these things, and, and they had wealth and gifts, and, you know, he speaks to the highs and the lows, Amen. It's, it doesn't matter what background you come from. Sometimes I, I feel like, you know, people put a priority on say, well, you know, the gospel is for the poor. I, I'm, you know, I don't believe that. I, 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 I want to qualify what Jesus and what the word of God was saying here. Because 
Jesus, yes, he chose people who were fishermen to be his followers, but he also had Matthew or Levi. He was, he was a tax collector. He was one of the high guys, you know. When Jesus walked into the city of Jericho, you know, he didn't go to other people. He went to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was one of the wealthiest people in the city. He was, he was up here, and, and Jesus went to him. You know, it's not a matter of your, your status in society. We don't, we don't, God doesn't look at us on the basis of what you've achieved or what your background is, or any of those things. The, the one thing that he looks for is, is this heart after me. That's what he's looking for. And so when he found this man, Simeon, he found somebody who had a heart that was willing. Amen? And, and right in the middle of my message, I just want to encourage every single person right now in this place, no matter what you bring here this morning, just to offer up this prayer and say, God, I am willing. Give me a willing heart. Nothing will put you in a place where you are going to encounter God where you are going to be used of God more than that simple offering. Don't think about all of the things that are behind. Don't think about all the things on the left. And just that one simple, sincere offering saying, God, I am willing. That's where it all starts. Now, what else do we know about about Simeon. What's special about him? Okay? Well, the Bible says a few things about him. It says this man was a, a just man and a devout man, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. So just quickly, what, are, what does this say to us about him? It says basically that he was righteous, that he, he didn't allow himself to be entangled by, by sin, right? He, he quickly kept himself pure. He was a just person. The Bible talks about him. God himself it gives him this designation. It says, this man was righteous. He was, he was right with me. And not only that, he was a devoted person, so he spent special time uh, whether, whether it was daily, whether it was hours at a time, or whatever, however he did it, the Bible qualifies and says, this person was dedicated and devoted to me. So I, I'm, I'm giving you these little, these little things so that we can all do an assessment, right? We can say, well, how am I doing on the righteousness side? God, am I, am I really going to you and, and cleansing myself regularly and daily, uh, you know, that I might be pure in your eyes, that I might be righteous in your sight? And, and, and am I giving myself on a day-to-day basis to, to time for devoted to prayer and to reading your word? These are the things that attract God's presence, right? And these are the things that, that the Holy Spirit is basically he's looking and saying, okay, who out there can I choose to show myself to because they have prepared themselves right, because they have a, a willing heart, because they have made themselves righteous in my sight and because they they dedicate time to seeking me and then it says about him that he says he was waiting for the consolation of israel his nation he was a lover of his nation of his people and he really really wanted to see his nation brought out of bondage and into comfort okay he wanted them to be refreshed which is basically the word uh the meaning of this word comfort some of the translations even say the refreshment of israel he was, he was really passionate to see that the, his people, and, and maybe this also speaks to some of you here, because really, I mean, sometimes people can get so focused in and so, so spiritual that they forget that there's people around them that are hurting, okay? But, but, but Simeon didn't. Simeon not only had a passion for God, but he had a passion for people that were around as well. He wanted them to experience the liberty and the comfort and the refreshment of the Lord. In fact, he was waiting for it and expecting it. This word wait is a, is a, a, a Greek word that means that you know that you're, you're having a special guest come to your house. And and so you're preparing for that guest to come. You know that they're supposed to come at a certain time. So what do you do? Well, I know what my wife does. She makes sure we clean up the house. Right? 
She makes sure, I mean, all the boys, they have to have their hair combed just right. I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a ritual to get ready for guests when they're coming. You know, and everything has to be just nice and okay. And that, but that's the word that's being used here. It wasn't just passively sitting around and waiting, but actively seeking a, a way that would welcome this special guest when he comes. So that's the word here that he's, that's used for waiting. And so he was an expectant person, right? He was, he was actively looking for and, and preparing himself for the arrival of this Messiah, which, by the way, Everybody else was looking for a certain type of Messiah. They thought the Messiah was going to be a, a, you know, a warrior type. This, this guy, he was going to be like, uh, you know, he was going to have a flaming sword in his hand. He was going to be somebody who was going to strike down Caesar and, and the Romans who were oppressing. This was their concept. No wonder they missed him when he came. Right? I mean, when, when Simeon got up that, this, that morning and he, and he heard that the Messiah, he was going to see the Messiah that day, what was he looking for? If he had been looking for a, you know, somebody who was buff, somebody who was handsome, you know, somebody who was like, he, he could tell, he just he carried himself with that kind of air, that's got to be him, right? No. He saw a baby. 40 days old, carried in the, in the arms of a, of a teenage girl. And he knew. I, I, I don't know about you. I find that extremely intriguing and challenging. I was like, you know, everybody else is expecting this. And God gives this. Because, but the heart that was ready, the heart that was, that was expectant, the heart that was pure, that heart understood. This baby is our answer. He's our deliverer. Not in the ways that people had, had assumed and, and thought about, but a completely different way. When God moves in Singapore, I want to be there. When, when God starts moving across the face of the earth, I want to be there. I, I don't know where the rest of the crowd is going to be, but I want to know. I want to be there. That's the cry that, that's, that's coming up from me this morning, and it's stirred, stirred this year at the beginning of the year by Simeon, an old man who knew what God was saying when he was saying it. Everybody else was looking for the deliverance of the Jews. But Simeon saw further than that. Did you notice that? He said, I'm not just thinking about that, that God was going to be a salvation to us and deliver us. He's saying he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. I know it sounds crazy. All of these people who are studying the Bible and researching the Bible and all of that, they still only saw this very narrow, kind of like this political agenda. And this is where I feel like my own nation, I'm reflecting and saying, how could the church be so consumed with a political thing that's going on? I mean, God is about things that are so much bigger, so much greater than, than something that's happening in Washington, D.C. on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. God is so much bigger than that. He's about preparing a bride so that he can come again. And he's looking for a people who have their antenna raised, not in, 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 in you know, what's happening and what's being broadcast on CNN, but is in tune and in step with what he's saying right now. And that's where I want to be. I don't want to be confused about this. And that's one other thing that we know about him is he was laser focused, right? It, you, you get this feeling, okay, about, about Simeon is that he, he, like, when he woke up in the morning, the thing that he thought about was, I want to see the Messiah. <laughs> I want whatever I needed. You know, while he was going about his things during the day, he wasn't being entangled by all of these other things. That it was always the thing that was there in a, in a kind of a very conscious way, no matter what he was doing in other things. You know, I don't want to, like, take a bunny trail too far, but let me just say this. Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. 
this is really, really hard for our natural mind to, to, to figure out. Because how can a lion be a lamb? When you approach a lion, you know he's scary and he's, ah, you know, he's got big teeth. And yet, when you, when you get close to him, he, he, he gets you with his, his fleece. What is he? Who is he? Well, sometimes he's a lion and sometimes he's a lamb. But the problem is, is that so oftentimes we align ourselves either with God as lion or God as lamb. And we don't know when his face is the face of a lion and when his face is the face of a lamb. I don't have all the answers for this, but in that generation, they were all looking for him like a lion, and they missed him when he came like a lamb. In our generation, maybe there's a lot of people who are thinking of him like a lamb, and when he comes like a lion, they will miss him. I offer that to you as something for you to consider, something that I'm working through and I'm thinking through and praying about that I don't want to have some sort of preconceived idea, well, God is going to be like this. I, I, I you know, I already have this idea. I've got, in fact, I've, I've worked out all of the details, uh, uh, when exactly he's going to return and when this, you know, well, this, when I read that in Revelation, it's got to be that, you know, and have it all worked out. No. I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to be in a place of purity of heart that when he moves, I know he's moving. It's not based upon some agenda or some, some other thing. Okay, let's look at the last thing that I want to look at about Simeon. And this is the thing that really, really I want to impart and, and deposit today. Because when I gave the title to this, I said that Simeon was a man of the Spirit. It says that, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. I, I, I find it very... When I, when I saw that, when I read that, th this word upon actually means rest upon as well, okay? So it, it, it means that when people looked at this guy, the first thing that you were impressed about was the Holy Spirit is all over that person. I mean, you could just see. It's like, I don't know where he's been, what he's been doing, but he carries God's presence, I'm sure you've seen people like that, right? Or, or people just came out of three hours of worship and presence and God, and it's like like Moses on the mountain, you know, their faces aglow. And, you know, sometimes you meet people like that. In fact, Mabel was like that. <laughs> Every time, I mean, Mabel had horrendous problems. Her, her, she actually took care of her bedridden brother, and and she lived in a very dark and cramped little quarters at the at the, at, a, at the end of a, of, a, of a street, and it was, it was horrendous. When I, I actually brought my mother and father to visit, and, and we went to visit all kinds of things during the, t the time that we were in China. I brought my parents around there in, in, um, in 19, um, I think it was 1989. And, and it was at that time we went in to visit, and, and the, the thing that, that impressed them most for the rest of their lives was not any of the things that they saw. It was, it was going to see Mabel in her little, her little hole in the ground. And what they didn't realize, and only heaven will be able to tell, is from that little, that little base, little old Mabel probably helped to distribute hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million Bibles, to people who were needy over the, over the, the 10 years that she lived, from the time that I met her to the time finally the Lord took her home. Extraordinary, extraordinary. But she was somebody, when you, when you saw her, she's kind of like, she was a light bulb. She was just, I mean, absolutely just so consumed. The Holy Spirit was all over Mabel. And, and that's, that's the kind of person I would, I would say, if, I, if we were to see Simeon, the first impression you would have, I would have, all of us would have is like, wow, this man, is, he's got the Holy Ghost all over him, right? 
And that's what the Bible says about him. And so why, why not? It continues on to say, and it has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. I mean, it's like everything that the Bible is using to describe this person is a man who, whom the Spirit spoke to. He was directed by the Spirit, right? He exercised the gifts of the Spirit because why? You know, he, he sees Mary and Joseph, and when he sees Mary and Joseph, what does he do? He takes up the baby, first of all. And, and think about this. Some of you moms, remember when you had little babies in arms? Okay. A stranger walks up to you in a crowded place. How many of you just kind of like uh, hand your baby over to an old guy in, in a crowded place? How many of you do that, right? You don't do that. Nobody does that. I mean, you're kind of like, well, you know, this is... The willingness to be able to, because this man carried something, right? He carried the presence of God, and, and, and he recognized Jesus, the Messiah, in that baby, and he took him up, and the first one to ever bless our Jesus <laughs> was this old guy. And then and he hands the baby back. He prophesies over the mom. He operates in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, it's interesting, in this story, we have um, somebody who's not known as a prophet who prophesies over the baby. And then you have this woman who's a prophetess who doesn't prophesy, but she tells everybody. She's an evangelist about what's happened. So don't pigeonhole, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, let, let, let's face it. God is free to move in people who are available to him. And, um, you know, it kind of reminds me, actually, this, this story takes place one chapter after another story, and that is the one where, where Jesus, uh, Jesus is now, has now impregnated this 16-year-old little girl. You know, girl. And, uh, and so Mary walks up the mountain path and finally walks into the house of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth feels something in her womb. And she interprets this as being the baby leaping in her womb. Now, again, unfortunately, us guys are having a hard time with this one. But all of you who have been moms, how could you tell if it was a kick or a leap? Right? I mean, come, I mean is it a kick or a leap? I mean... I'm sure that I'm sure John had kicked her, a, you know, a lot of times. But on that day, it was a leap. And why? Because she was a woman of the Spirit. She was a, a woman who was sensitive to the Spirit. When the baby kicked, she knew it wasn't just an ordinary kick. Because, she, like Simeon, she was sensitive to what God was doing and what God was saying. I want to be like that. I want to be somebody who who knows when God is moving. When it, when it, what looks like a what feels like a kick to an ordinary person to somebody who is who is walking by the Spirit, who's led by the Spirit, who's full of the Spirit, is a leap. And that's where I want to be. And then finally, what it says about him is he was bold. He wasn't shy about this. I mean, he, in the middle of this, this, whole, this whole temple, you know, crowded temple, all of these people, he really doesn't care what other people are saying. Right? It's like how many people looked at him taking this little baby up in his arms and, you know, and then sees him prophesying and, and blessing the baby and then, and then announcing that this baby is the Messiah. Now, this takes a certain amount of assurance from the Holy Spirit, right? A confidence that this, in fact, is God. Otherwise, you're the fool of the century, taking a little baby up in your arms and then declaring in front of you know, all these people in a temple. Uh, apparently, you know, Anna wasn't so far away. She in earshot. There was some commotion over here. She wandered over. She sees what's happening, and she immediately knows, yeah, this is God, right? That's not a kick. That's a leap. 
And so he wasn't afraid of people. He wasn't concerned what other people were, were saying and what they were talking about. He just focused in on the Lord Jesus. He focused. He focused on God. He, 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 he wasn't distracted by, by circumstances and things that were around him. He didn't care whether people would think that he was a, just a, a foolish old man. He let God move him. And he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, Rock of Ages, this morning, this is what I want to present to you and leave to you. This year, let's, let's be led of the Spirit. Let's be a, a people of the Spirit. Here, it keeps saying that he was, it was by the Spirit that he went into the temple. And ask yourself, well, what does it mean when, it, when I go by the Spirit into my office tomorrow? Not just into your office, but by the Spirit. Make the, those three little words, right? Add them to your vocabulary this year. When you go to the market, you can go like you've gone every other day, but if you go to the market by the Spirit, what does that look like? On that day, he went to the temple. How many times had he been to the temple, right? But by the Spirit, he was able to see something. And my cry... For me, and my prayer for you, is that this year we would begin to move by the Spirit.